All right. We are live on YouTube. It's funny. We, I don't think we, as the ISA, use, um, well, we don't use YouTube live. And we should. We should do that more. We're going to be looking into that. And we're inspired by Imagine This in order to do that. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm assuming people are kind of filing in slowly, so I'm not going to just jump right into the topic. Um, but I'm very grateful that I was invited back to do this again. Um, Patrice reminded me that my little cat um, was with me for a lot, a lot of the uh, lecture last year. He he won't be this time because I have a slightly different setup. I have a stand up desk now, and he doesn't have a lap to sit in. Um, he might be by my feet eventually, but um, it'll be a little less distracting, at least on my side. So um, let's just get into it. I, I'm I'm excited to get into this topic. It's a it's a big one. Um, it could go much longer than the hour that we are allotted here. Um, but, uh, and I am going to be reading from my notes. Hopefully that isn't too distracting. I'll do my best to keep this as entertaining as possible, as opposed to some boring, um, lecture, you know, instructor reading something to everybody. I, I I'm going to keep this lively as much as I can. Questions of course will be, um, answered at the end. I'm going to leave some time. We'll probably go you know, probably a full hour if I, you know, go slowly through uh, my lecture, start going off on tangents, which I technically tend to do sometimes, maybe we'll go a little bit longer. But um, if you have questions, throw them in there, and I will happily answer as many as I can. Um, but for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Max Tim. Uh, I, I wear a ton of hats. Um, I'm a consultant and coach with screenwriters. I have been since about 2006 working with writers one-on-one, -on -one, um, and I help them develop their material from a step-by-step -step approach, but with a lot of education mixed in. So I kind of take a 50, 50, you know, 50, percent creative development, brainstorming notes, obviously, uh, via calls, but I, I mix a lot of education in there because, uh, you know, from a consulting and coaching standpoint, if I'm not teaching you something that you can then go use on your own, then you're completely reliant on working with me for the rest of your life. <laughs> not that I don't want to work with you for the rest of your life, but I want to hopefully teach you something so that you don't need to be going to consultants for the rest of your life. Um, but I'm also the director of education with the International Screenwriters Association. I created coursework for them. I host a bunch of events. We're launching a new membership uh, pretty soon, probably around January or so, that's going to be very educationally oriented, um, an elevated version of what the ISA currently has called Connect. Um, more to come on that. It's not quite ready. But then I'm also the co-VP of development with Creative Screenwriter Productions, where we actively go out and pitch projects. And it's been a ton of fun the past two years, having some very cool meetings, um, pitching some exciting um, projects. Nothing sold yet. It's just kind of the nature of the business. Um, it's a tough one, especially now. And not that we need to go into industry news or anything, but um, it's a tough business. But uh, you are all here to dedicate your time, which is all extremely valuable. Uh, to hopefully learning something. And I, I think there's um, a lot to say about that. You're actually taking the time to spend it not only with me, but on focusing on further your, furthering your um, writing talent and, and know-how. And, and you're trying to get a leg up and that's huge because some writers don't think they need to. Think, they think they can do this on their own. So bravo to you for, for hanging out with me here. Um, but what I want to focus on is a topic that would take, like I said, much longer than an hour if I go through all the details, but it's important to cover because it's kind of covering the whole thing, you know, in terms of the writing process. Um, but it's also important because I think, and I am firmly confident that you all already know this about what I'm to about to talk about. Um, you inherently know what full development is, but we don't all really grasp the importance of the organizational aspects of it. In, in other words, we understand the elements of writing and rewriting and that we have to do that. <laughs> but how I approach full development with my writers is to have them see everything from a bird's eye view early on, but then learn how to always stay up high at that bird's eye view for the entire process while simultaneously getting into the detailed step-by-step -step approach of writing the project. And, you know, I, I think that the easiest way to, to think about a bird's eye view is to just really fully, completely understand what your concept is, to stay in that conceptual development level for the entire process of your writing and development, even when you're in the pages. And that sounds easy enough. Um, but how I take my writers through that process, it can at first seem as if we're always just at the starting line, like even after the gun goes off, like everybody else is in front of us and we're like, okay, wait a minute, I'm still back here. <laughs> um, but what I mean is 
by full development. It's going through all the phases of your project, concept, character development, structure, and page work. And really kind of with an emphasis on then the page work. And, and just by placing the, the development process kind of within these four levels, it just, it helps our brain stay organized and, and stay focused on what it is we're doing and, and when we're doing it. So it, in other words, it helps shape our writing sessions as opposed to only thinking, I have to write 10 pages today. If you don't know where your story is going or who these characters are, you know, well enough anyway, and where certain things are going to happen, those 10 pages are just going to remain blank <laughs> or it's like a diary entry or something. You, you got to do the work beforehand. And this is what I mean. You all already inherently know this, um, but it's one, it's part of the biggest problem I've seen not only um, in the writers I work with, but in my own writing career, I'm definitely speaking from experience here. Um, we tend to come up with this idea, you know, a, a story idea, which is technically and usually <clears throat> just a setup to a story. Then we jump right into, you know, final draft, page one, and we just start plowing through the words on the page. And it's because that's what feels like is the real writing. You know, that's where we as writers find the romance in that process. You know, the interior greasy spoon and getting into the deep metaphorical visuals. Of, it's going to wow the writer. It's going to make them fall in love with me, not the writer, the reader. Um, you know, my dialogue is going to sing and the intensity of these characters within the moment. It's, it's going to sell the script. That's why we love to write, because that's the fun part, <laughs> you know. But <clears throat> I hate to say this because it sounds negative and pessimistic, but I don't mean it this way. It's just if we're coming at the writing process in, in the so-called right way, you know, this full development process, most of our time spent actually isn't in the pages. It should be on the other three levels of development, concept, character, and structure. Because if those four levels, I should say three levels, not including the page writing, um, aren't working or they don't connect or they're not the best version of your idea, then the pages and all those amazing scenes and the dialogue and everything, it doesn't matter. You know, um, you know how many times have we come up with an idea and we just jump right to pages, find ourselves at page 36. We kind of get depressed. We start thinking we can't write. We put the script away. We don't touch it again for six months. And then we try to start the process all over again. And suddenly we're a year into trying to finish the script and we're barely halfway through it. And I'm speaking from experience. I've done this. So what I try to have my writers do is to work on those other three levels of, of development for far longer than they think they should. So heavy conceptual development, logline development, hook development, character work, and flaw work, um, it, then a ton of time in the outlining mode. I know some writers don't love to outline. Um, I don't think there's any one right way to outline. I have a, a very particular process, um, but you know, we think of outlining as like Roman numeral one and then dot, and then here's this, and then we have to have a formatted approach. Outlining can just be freehand writing or, you know, just here's what I think is going to happen when, but the more you go through it and the more you study structure and where certain things should be happening. And I'm heavy air quoting that because not, you know, structure isn't just a perfect formula. Um, I get point being my emphasis on the outlining mode can work with how you work. We just have to spend time there. I know a lot of writers, and I, I'm, maybe I'm repeating myself, but um, they say, no, I just come up with the idea and go into the pages. If you can finish a script that way, great, but you better be ready to rewrite that thing about five or six more times than you probably would have needed had you spent the time in this kind of full development process that I'm talking about. Um, and you know, it, it, I, again, the reason why I have my writers take this route is because they always end up finding that when they're finally done with this really detailed outline I forced them to go through, <laughs> the scenes on the page end up writing themselves when you get into the pages because you've already written them. You know, you know the reason for the scene existing, the point from a thematic perspective, what a character wants and why, where they are in the trajectory of their own arc, um, who else is in the scene, why they're in the scene. Um, and, you know, the the, the scenes, though, are just, they're not formatted. You know, they're in your outline, but they're not in script format. And there's something that happens to our brains as screenwriters when we get into the screenwriting program, whatever you use, you know, final draft, movie, magic, whatever. We get tied up in, in trying to figure out the best scene heading or should we use a parenthetical or what kind of transition 
can I use? Or maybe I shouldn't use transitions because this consultant five years ago told me that I can't use them. And you know, you're overthinking things. You get hung up on that one right word or line of dialogue. But if you haven't fully developed the concept and tested it to see if the concept's even worth your time, because sometimes concepts just aren't worth your time. And there are only so many screenplays we can write in our lifetime, especially if and when we have jobs and you know life responsibilities we're a parent or something that you don't have 40 hours a week not all of us anyway to spend working on a script so you really have to be careful uh, and and make sure that this concept is something that you feel really confident about and passionate about and that it is at least in some way marketable i mean there are there is room for film as an art form. Um, there's a whole bunch of, um, you know, talk about the movie Blonde right now with Anna de Armas and, um, you know, it's talk about polarizing. But I loved it from a standpoint of an art form. Look at this piece of artwork. And I knew it was fictionalized. I knew it wasn't a biopic. I went in understanding that and some people may not have. Um, and I thought it was amazing, extremely difficult to watch. You know, I, I don't ever want to watch that movie again. Um, Nonetheless, point being, you have to spend the time on understanding what is this project that I have? Where could it live? Who would make this? How much might it cost? Even if I just have a general blanket statement, because I have a lot of writers ask me, well, how do you know how much your movie costs? You probably can just assume, you know, look at some other movies that are that you want to kind of fit in the same mold, try to find out what their budget might have been. It's a, a range, you know. Um, but you got to spend that time. And then, of course, the character development and then working through the, st the structure of it all. Um, because if you haven't fully developed that concept, if you haven't tested it, if it's worthwhile, if it has legs from a marketability standpoint, you know, that one line of dialogue, it's just wasting your time. You're getting hung up on something that isn't yet important. It's eventually important. And maybe there is one line of dialogue that you have that, you that you're like, ooh, that defines something. It means something. I'm going to put it in a separate document. Don't go into final draft and try to write a scene around that. If you're, if you know and understand that you're just writing the scene as a, a way to test a character's voice or something, and you're not going to continue going beyond that scene, or great. Quentin Tarantino is famous for that. He just wrote a ton of scenes over his career, threw them in a drawer, and then made Pulp Fiction out of it. <laughs> kind of only half joking. Um, but anyway, we'll take a little time to dig into um, each level with a little bit more detail. Of course, I'll answer questions, you know, about anything um, when we're done. It doesn't have to only be about just what I'm talking about here. If you have questions about contests, you have questions about the industry, whatever, you can ask me whatever you want. Um, I'm wondering if I can share my screen. Let's see if that works. It should. Nope, hasn't. Okay. <laughs> it's been disabled. That's okay. I'll go through this. Um, it's a little bit of a list where I'm talking about concept. Okay. So a lot of things to be asking yourself. <clears throat> For one, and I know this sounds odd because I've been kind of dividing up these levels, you know, into it almost like they're separate concept, character, structure, page work. They're all connected. It just when you organize it in that way, you can start seeing things a little bit easier. But so we'll just go through some questions for your concept. OK, who's our main character? What's that character's flaw? I know that sounds terribly ironic, <laughs> but I'm getting right into that in terms of. Um, Oh, it looks like I can share my screen. Let's try to share my screen here. You can just see this right along with me. <clears throat> okay, cool. I'm going to blow this up a little bit and see if we can make it easier to read. Okay, so who's our main character? What's that character's flaw? You want to consider flaw as something deeper that is creating the personal issues in her life. Okay, there's, you know, there's an obvious connection to the character level of development, like I said, but flaw matched with the situation or the plot that your character is in, that defines your concept. Then, of course, you want to ask the basic question, what's the plot goal? What's the main character's personal goal? They're usually two different things. And then how do they differ? Uh, what's the presented situation that the character will live in in the second act? That sounds like a really fancy way of acting, of, of just asking what happens? <laughs> what's, what's the middle of my story? What's the middle of this concept? As an example, excuse me, um, I have an idea and I've had an idea for a movie that I know from a marketability standpoint is it could be a, an easy sell. I have no idea what the middle of my movie is yet. So I haven't even started writing it. I've had this movie idea for like a year. <laughs> I haven't really spent the time to sit down and try to crack it, <clears throat> but it's been kind of killing me. I know that the setup and the pitch is amazing, 
I don't know what the second act is. I'm not going to bother working on the second act if I can't figure it out. Well, I'll say that differently. I'm not going to bother telling people about the project or trying to just plow my way through the pages of it if I can't really figure out what that situation is. So another term, recurring moment. And recurring moment is just another term for what are we going to see, generally speaking, happen over and over again? The type of moment we're going to see. That's in reference to the hook. So obviously the question, what is the hook? And that goes for TV just as much, if not more, because you're obviously spending that much more time in this story and in multiple storylines. But that idea of recurring moment, what's, you know, this reference of the hook, what's bringing the, the audience back every episode? What's going to keep people interested in the middle of your movie? And, you know, the big, obvious, easy movies to think about is like Liar, Liar or Back to the Future. You know, those high concept movies, you can see that hook easily, but just about every movie, if not arguably every single story, has a hook. There's something that keeps us engaged in the middle of our story. This is a huge part of your conceptual development. If you haven't taken the time to figure out what that is and really define it and know what it is, it's going to be difficult to deliver and execute your second act because you're just not quite hitting what needs to be hit. Um, do we obviously know what the genre is? And will the second act deliver on that genre? That's I, I, pretty obvious and straightforward. What are similar comps for this project? This is a question that's referencing uniqueness. And from a level of uniqueness, um, have we seen the character before? If so, what can we do to make the, this character just a little bit different, to elevate that character a little bit? You want to be a student of the genre that you're writing in, for sure, because then you'll understand the prior characters that have come within that genre. When you're dealing in straight drama, it's a little tricky because, you know, you're going across so many different types of stories. But if you're writing in romantic comedies or horror thriller, sci-fi, fantasy, you should be a student of those genres for sure. Um, have we seen this situation before? Does the character combine with the situation? Help make your project like nothing else audiences have seen. We really do want to be critical of, of our idea, not of ourselves, but of our idea. I, you know, you want to look at the movie like, like The Purge. You know, there are plenty of elements that are familiar and kind of derivative in that movie, like the family, the father figure, how they act. But when you put those derivative elements into a situation that's unique, you know, that one night a year anarchy, it makes the characters feel a little more unique. They really aren't though. <laughs> the difficulty with uniqueness is the execution of the uniqueness in a simple way. And I, I, I use a random example of this movie, Cloud Atlas with Tom Hanks here. Not a whole lot of people saw it. Maybe you did. Um, I saw it because I loved Cl Cloud. Uh, I loved Tom Hanks. I liked the approach to the concept, at least from a, you know, trailer standpoint but does, does anyone really know what that movie was about i mean maybe thematically there were a whole bunch of lessons learned but just because it was like it was unique it doesn't necessarily mean it was entertaining so you know the through line of the story was just all over the place they had all these different characters it was a purposely jumbled timeline and structure these were artists in terms of the directors who knew what they were doing they wanted to try this in, in a much much different way it sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't um and if you love Cloud Atlas, great. <laughs> I'm not trying to you know, persuade you otherwise. Um, but then if you look at the Queen's Gambit in, in terms of its uniqueness, you know, we've seen all the elements of that story separately in some form, but we haven't necessarily seen them revolving around the world of chess. That's interesting. Um, here's an important note. So dialogue does not make a concept unique. Dialogue does not deliver the concept. The conflict inherent in your situation is what makes your project unique. And that conflict is directly related to your character's flaw and wound and personal beliefs and so on. That's why character development is so important. The catch is that the character drives the conflict and thus the situation because that character is making choices. But you don't have to have a unique character in order to have a unique concept. That's key. But in, in, in most and not all projects that have truly unique characters, have titles with the character's name in it, just because it's so rare. It's about that person, Shrek, Austin Powers, that Hancock uh, movie with uh, Will Smith, um, the Amazon show, Hannah. We haven't really seen those types of characters before. And it's really difficult to come up with a whole brand new character. It's usually star driven in some way. Um, so that's a whole bunch of stuff to consider where concept is concerned. Um, so we'll, we'll dive into character development. Um, and of course, you know, I don't have a whole lot to talk about directly related to character development in terms of all these different 
kind of practices and exercises you can do because character and structure are very much intertwined. I do have a couple of things we can talk about, but um, yes, of course, backstory. You want to understand your character's backstory. You just don't want to live in backstory for too long because suddenly the script becomes about the backstory. <laughs> um, yes, we want to work on flawed development. Um, and that comes from a place of really understanding what flaw means. It, flaw isn't just something like, you know, the person, you know, has some kind of physical flaw or something that a flaw is what we see on screen is usually like how the character is reacting and responding to things is usually a symptom of something deeper. There's a deeper level of a flaw. Like if someone may be an alcoholic, sure, that can, of course, be considered a flaw, but there's something that's causing the alcoholism. That is really where you're getting into the heart of your story. And ultimately, it's not the alcohol the character needs to face up to. It's what's causing him or her to drink, you know? And I apologize for using that horrible example. <laughs> In terms of alcoholism, it's nothing to, to just kind of throw to the wind. But um, I think you know what I mean. That, that's, that's the story. Like that person facing up to whatever's going on deeper inside of that character. That's what really is the inherent conflict. So you want to be digging in. Like what, sure, that character may be reacting to certain ways because they're kind of naive or they're, they're a smart aleck or maybe, you know, they're blindly ambitious. These are all important things to label as far as what your character's flaw might be. But the wound, there's something deeper in there. Jen Grisanti uses the word wound a lot in, in character development. She's another consultant. Um, it's important to get a little bit deeper. But also we can, we can focus on moment listing based on flaws. So this is just an open-ended Word document kind of brainstorming um, tool that you can do. Basically, you're coming up with moments that you may not even yet know if they will exist in your movie. Or, or TV show yet, but based on some of these flaws that you've, you know, kind of given the character in a way, um, you then come up with moments that are going to force that character to face up to the flaw. And as many as you can, try to get up to 50 and just list them. You don't have to go into long detailed explanations, but whatever situation you can put that character in that is going to force that character to face up to the flaw in some way. And it could be in huge ways, like literally facing a dragon and this character is terrified of dragons or whatever. Um, or, you know, obviously you go a little bit deeper or there's smaller things like there's another character that is, you know, in some form of a relationship with that character and, the, and this that character represents something. The main character has to face up to something that character does. It could be anything. So it's a list of moments that are going to force the character to face up to the flaw, because that's ultimately every story. I hate making blanket statements like that, but that's basically what a story is. But then also windows, windows into who your character is. They can show us who that character is without relying on dialogue. So you're coming up with anything from the type of bedside clock on you know the side table next to the bed the type of artwork on the walls the clothes they wear the car they drive the food they eat things that are non-verbal <clears throat> that show us who this person is because those then can help define your first 10 pages of a feature if you will we see these things and we don't need the character to really even say that much look at legally blonde that whole intro of legally blonde of kind of walking through the sorority uh, house and the college atmosphere. And then we eventually see Reese Witherspoon's characters, um, you know, uh, bedroom and it's all pink and it's all flat. We didn't even need her to say a word. And we understood the so-called type that she is. Then of course, the whole idea of the movie is to show that she is not technically that stereotype. Um, but this is what I mean in terms of windows and character development. So it's, it's more than just prose brainstorming backstory stuff, you know, and you also have to kind of basically do the same thing with the secondary character. You want to consider how that secondary character or a group of secondary characters, you can have multiple, how those characters are going to affect the main character. And by effect, I mean, change. And it's either conscious or unconscious in terms of their intent to affect the main character. And that effect is played out over the course of an up and down relationship with this other person per, or persons, plural. Um, most importantly, you wanna consider who these char secondary characters are in terms of their own flaws, beliefs, types, just like you did for the main character. So in other words, if you're developing a concept, you get through the idea, like, okay, I think I know what this is. Um, you then get into character and you look at Finding Nemo. Like if Marlon, 
he's this overprotective father. He can't let anything go. There's a lot more to him than that, but we'll just say that for now. It makes sense then that he teams up with a secondary character like Dory, who literally forgets everything every 10 minutes. Like she physically can't <laughs> hold on to anything. So this is an exaggerated version or example of what I'm talking about. As far as this character development, what type of secondary character would fit in this relationship with the main character so that the main character can change? Uh, 40-year-old virgin is a good example. We have you know, Steve Carell's character, and then his secondaries are all these guys that are trying to get him on dates. And you know they're apparently very confident in their sexuality, and they've dated a ton. They're really just a bunch of morons. But you know, the, it's the types, those two different types that are kind of clashing. That's going to help with that level of entertainment. So looking at um, structure, I try to take it a, as a little bit more of an emotional approach to structure as opposed to just straight logistical. Because structure is not perfect as far as formula. I teach this 12 sequence approach to a feature. It's a little bit easier to see it in, in, in a movie. Um, TV follows the same kind of beat structure as a general story does, you know, from episode um, into episode, but also within each episode, you have sequences one through 12 showing up in a way. And I'll explain what these are. I'm not going to have time to go through the details of every single sequence, um, but it does really help to be able to brainstorm from that level of structure. So in other words, if we have 12 sequences in a movie, the, each sequence is roughly 10 pages long. It's not perfect. But if we just look at it from that approach, 12 sequences times 10, you have 120 pages. Don't write a 120 page script. <laughs> not every sequence is created equal. Some are much shorter, some are a little bit longer. But nonetheless, that just at least allows us to kind of you know organize our brain. The first act is three sequences. The second act is six sequences. The third act is three sequences. So that's it's just a way to organize. Here are the three acts of, of my feature script. In an hour long, you usually have five acts. Sometimes they have a teaser plus five acts. Sometimes they have a long teaser with four acts. It's kind of all over the place for TV, but you're still following this approach of sequence one, it's main character establishing, you know, the stage of life they're in. We see the flaw personality type. Um, we pr probably see the other people in this person's life. We get a look into the world that this character is living in, sometimes in a very literal way. It's like 1963 Chicago suburbs or something or the moon, you know, whatever the world is. Um, and we usually see what this character is desiring in some way, a personal goal of some kind. Sequence two is a setup event. A lot of people call it the inciting incident. Basically, it's an opportunity for the character to pursue their personal goal within like a, a plot structure, meaning here's this achievement that you should try to achieve. <laughs> Trying to dumb it down as much as I can because every story is different. But there's that setup event. Um, and then the third sequence is the secondary character kind of introduction, so-called. It's not like we have to wait until the end of the first act to meet that secondary lead. Um, but we see the impact even more so uh, um, on the main character by way of that secondary in, within this pursuit they're about to go on. Okay, so that's your first act. By the end of that first act, we have to know all those things. We know what they're pursuing, why they're pursuing it, who's going to be going along the ride, so-called, um, how they affect that main character, et cetera, et cetera. Sequences four through nine make up your second act. So sequences four, five, and six, we'll say, is technically the first half of your first of your second act. And it's, you know, new world experiences. Um, the main character and the secondary character are kind of coming together. The relationship's kind of working out. The opponent motive is very clear. We see what the opponent is trying to do and why they're doing it. Um, we don't know how they're trying to do it just yet. Obviously, there's some mystery there. The opponent isn't really winning all that often, but there's intent and it's, you know, stakes are being presented. But the main character and the secondary character are working together and they're, and they're pursuing this goal, not without obstacles, obviously. There are challenges and tests, et cetera. But we're, we're seeing this character reacting to something very new, um, but, and they're staying within their place of flaw. They're not really changing. They're having new experiences, but that old way, you know, the flaw is still working for them. The, the sixth sequence comes along and there's that's the big plot twist, complication, midpoint, fork in the road. Um, and it's not just a plot twist. You know, and that's something I spent a little bit of time with some of my writers over the past week talking about how <clears throat> that term has become a little too simplified because a plot twists 
because there's an emotional problem that comes with it, right? The stakes have been presented for that main character based on what that main character's goal, personal goal, was in the beginning. It, the easiest way to see it is when Harry met Sally. Harry and Sally sleep together. Harry did not want a relationship. He was terrified of being vulnerable. Sally, you know, wanted one, uh, and, and but at the same time probably was terrified to do it with a friend. Um, and so there's a big complication and it changes everything. So not only the plot situation of can these two people be friends, which is the general plot, and then the situations we see them in, but it's the personal things. The desires are also complicated. Um, in a more traditional approach, When Harry Met Sally was a little different in terms of the structural approach, very unique, um, especially for its time. But um, in most you know, traditional elements, once we're done with that midpoint complication, we know that there's a new direction the character has to take. Sequence seven, sequences seven through nine, then show that character taking and going in pursuit of this goal within this new direction. And things are not working. So it's kind of the opposite of the first half of your second act, okay? Now, the reason I'm trying to call this not just logistical structure, but instead emotional structure is because I'm constantly keeping the character's emotional resonance, if you will, like their, their desires and their feelings and their flaw are constantly being changed and altered and affected and, and confronted throughout all of this. So it's not just a beat by beat you know, this has to happen by this page kind of thing. I don't care about where certain things need to happen on, on a page standpoint. Um, we need to be looking at things more from a character flaw development approach. I'm going way off my notes here. <laughs> but nonetheless, sequences seven, eight, and nine make up the second half of your second act. Um, the opponent um, starts winning. We see some victories on the opponent side. The main character is failing. The big thing to remember about the main character in that second half of the second act, and this can go for TV as well. It's just you're kind of it's folding into multiple acts in the second half of the story. Um, but the main character is pushing. The mayor, this this person is forcing the issue. You know, they're forcing the pursuit. And through that, relationships, you know, kind of crack, they break open a little bit, they don't work, they're not on the same page. Um, and this, this main character is trying so hard to achieve this goal, but they're kind of going about it the wrong way. It's almost like the flaws are, are they've been exposed now, and now it's getting a little scary for this main character, because now that he, he or she is trying to not feel those scary feelings. I'm getting really specific here. <laughs> but um, that eventually leads them to sequence nine which is the low point. The low point is usually created by the main character. They do something that causes the failure, the plot failure, so-called, but the failure is very deeply rooted in a personal failure. Um, relationships, you know, either crumble, and, you know, a character, there's usually an estrangement between the two, the main secondary character leaves, Obi-Wan literally dies in Star Wars, you know, um, and that marks the end of the second act. The third act then, sequences 10, 11, and 12. Sequences 10 and 11 are usually the shortest. Um, it's just because we're seeing the character kind of wallowing in self-pity in the beginning of the third act, and then there's a little bit of this rallying of the troops in the, in the 11th sequence. Um, somebody comes along, reminds this main character what he or she is fighting for. They have a new plan. The 12th sequence is the big climax, and the main character has to face up to the opponent who ultimately represents the deeper issues that's going on inside of this main character. You can see that, obviously, that would be a much longer lecture, and I only have about 10 minutes <laughs> before we get into questions. So I'll get through some of this as far as this emotional structure approach. Um, as an example, um, oh gosh, see, now I don't really have as much time, but like it if you look it's like every movie is different, every story is different, whether it's TV or a book or a movie, but you know, knowing this is why it's important to understand the concept, you know, what the genre is like for an example um, in an action adventure movie, like back to the future, we have this big conceptual hook and there are nearly constant twists and turns, you know, new problems, almost every scene while they're pursuing this big obvious plot goal. So you don't really need to spend all that much time on deep character development in the first act in a movie like Back to the Future, because, hey, we kind of just get it with Marty. He's this kind of know-it-all, you know, high school student who just doesn't really take life all that seriously. Um, but then B, the audience wants to get into the big fun in the adventure quickly, you know, and so that's why they're they're tuning in. That's why we want to watch Back to the Future. So we'll get to know Marty a little bit more and more as the adventure moves forward, you know. So the concept and character, like, like I've said, it drives the structure. Those two elements and what they are 
then helps you determine where can things live and work. The concept and character drive how your story structure will work. So if you have a slow sweeping historical drama that doesn't inherently come with these big thrills and action sequences, then holding true to some of that formulaic approach can be important because you, you, know, you still need twists and turns. You have to develop what those complications are going to be, even in these big, you know, sweeping epic historical drama and romances, et cetera. You'll probably spend a little bit more time up front in character development. So we know who we're dealing with before we get into the, the, the ongoing conflict and drama. You know, the, so those twisting emotional moments in the second act are that much more important to brainstorm because we spent a lot more time getting to know who this character is. You know, so you want the payoffs. Otherwise, there won't be this heartbeat to the story, so-called. And so using those 12 sequences as the guide, while remembering that the sequences are in place for you to brainstorm new problems, opportunities, directions, every 10 pages, again, heavy air quote, um, then it, you'll start to see, oh, I'm kind of telling a story in every sequence. There's a beginning, middle, and end to these sequences. Um, and that idea of every 10 pages, a new problem or twist occurs, it holds even truer in a genre that doesn't necessarily or naturally have big thrills and sequences like a horror or an action adventure or something. You know, it, Oddly enough, in action adventure stories, you probably need twists and turns happening more than just every 10 pages because that would be really boring. Um, so it's just a reminder that structure is driven by character, but it's also driven by concept. We have to be fully aware of the type of story we're presenting and the level of expectation from the audience that comes with it. If you know you have a historical period piece that is going to take a little bit longer to take off, that's fine. You can establish the story a little bit longer. You can stay in that and, and make sure that this is a character piece, so-called, and then you get into the, you know, the, the bigger, um, you know, hook of the second act, but this goes for equally for TV yeah, because you know, TV, like I said, is a totally different monster. You have a much less captivated audience in TV. Ironically, um, you know, the attention span of a TV audience is much shorter than in a feature. Um, more often than not, when people sit down to watch a movie, they're like, I'm going to watch this movie. <laughs> you know, they experience the full story, even though, you know, we hear of people walking out of theater or stopping 20 minutes in or whatever, because they're bored. It happens more often than not. You watch the whole movie, you know, especially when you're able to stream things from your couch. But with TV, it's a regular occurrence that I'm sure you all know that you could stop watching the, the series after the first episode because you're just not all that interested anymore, you know, and suddenly the people who made that show are like, well, we've got nine more episodes. <laughs> You're not going to watch anymore. So that means keeping your audience entertained every five pages or less in TV. Entertained could be, an, that's such a broad word. You know, what does that mean to entertain your audience? It comes from knowing the concept and the character and the situations you're going to put that character in. Um, you know, it's completely relative to the story, but we have less time to get the audience's attention um, in TV. So again, the, the sequential order and, and structure can help you hit your mark from a sequential beat to sequential beat. Otherwise, sometimes you may end up spending too much time, say in sequence, you know, three or something, you know, like, oh gosh, wait a minute, this is, I'm going, I'm running way too long. I'm spending so much time in this scene with all this expositional dialogue. Let's just wait a minute. I need to get to, you know, something happening. Um, so with all that said, we're not, you know, even mentioning how essential, the, well, I did mention how the essential emotional structure is. We just want to be thinking of it from an emotional structure standpoint. And a lot of it can be looked at, like I said, in terms of breaking up act two into two halves, the first half of the second half act and the second half of the second act. And in kind of tracking the trajectory of your character in terms of how they're reacting to the situations they're reacting to. Um, in other words, it's all flaw-based confrontation, you know, in the first half of that second act, the character is just going with it and they're not changing and, and it's okay because things are kind of working. Something happens at the midpoint that they're like, oh, I can't do it that way anymore. I'm going to fight against that a little bit and I'm going to do it even harder <laughs> in terms of coming from a place of flaw. And that then changes the feel of the second half of your story, right? You have kind of the adventure mode in the first half of the second act. And then you have the real journey mode in the second half of the second act, because it's hard, you know, a journey and that word inherently comes with this idea that this is going to be difficult. An adventure is like, Hey, this is fun. I'm going to go for a hike. You know, look at Lord of the Rings, Bilbo and, or, uh, well, Bilbo, but, um, Sam and Frodo were like, let's just start walking. <laughs> and then as they go, oh, wait a minute, this is not what we expected. 
And it's all, you know, it's much more conceptually driven than just flaw based confrontation in Lord of the Rings. But again, it's because of the genre. So um, I talked about all of this, yeah, the, the logistical structure, emotional structure. Um, it's important to note that you want to consider that structure is really just a placeholder. You know, true structure is emotional structure. And in a big way, it almost doesn't matter where or when certain events occur in your story. As long as your character is facing up to the deeper, more emotional issues he or she needs to face up to, because that is ultimately what's going to lift your story up above everyone else's. That's why that concept and character development is so important. Why does this character have to experience the situation you're going to put them in? The idea that you came up with. So of course, you know, when it comes to page writing, which is the, the final um, level of development, um, all of what I could say about page writing mainly comes from a place of formatting in a lot of ways. Um, but obviously for dialogue, I think my best advice would be to make sure you spend as much time honing your character's voices, knowing who they are, how they would react to virtually any situation, then give them a very clear belief system matching with their level of stakes where the plot is concerned. So I know this sounds weird because I'm not exactly saying, here's how you write dialogue, but it's the development of the character that ultimately helps you write their dialogue. Their dialogue comes from that inner place of who they are, as opposed to just you, the writer, trying to get exposition on the page. I think that's something important to kind of note sometimes, to pay attention when you're writing. Um, every now and then, just kind of pay attention to, am I writing this dialogue? Or is this what the character would say here? Um, and again, it goes back to fully knowing and understanding your, your characters because, you know, we, we can't tell a movie. You know, when <laughs> we watch a movie, we, we show a movie. When you're going to watch a movie with, you know, your significant other on the couch at night, you ask, what do you want to watch? You don't say, what do you want to listen to? So the dialogue, <laughs> it, it's technically used to enhance the visual moments on the screen to comment on them and then deliver subtlety so that the audience can participate in the visuals that they're seeing. And I think that's so key from, from a page writing standpoint, I could do a whole lecture just on page writing, but um, what is the audience seeing? What does the visual mean? And obviously not every single line of action or scene direction has to have some kind of thematic meaning or metaphor, but nonetheless, what does it mean? You know, you still have to ask this a little bit, even just the movements the characters are taking sometimes. Exposition pulls the audience out of the participation process because they're just being told what to know and how to think and feel. So you want to come from a place of being unexpected in the line of dialogue, um, not just answering and replying to what somebody else says, being fully within who that character is and knowing within that scene, what does this character want? versus what that character wants. Watch any Aaron Sorkin movie. Um, watch um, uh, Marriage Story. Is it called Marriage Story? Yeah, I think Adam Driver and Scarlett Johansson. Um, for whatever reason, Marriage Story is not like clicking. It doesn't sound right. <laughs> um, anyway, th those are those four levels of development. Concept, character, structure, page work. And I know I'm starting at the top, seeming like, oh, like concept, and then down to character development, then down to structure, then to page writing. Technically, it's flipped. Because if you don't develop concept, character, and structure, page writing just is going to fail. There's no foundation. You don't. Have, why bother with the, with the page writing? That's why. That's what I'm dealing with with this idea that I'm trying to just kind of pluck out of my head. What is my second act? I don't know what the situation is exactly. I'm probably being a little overly critical, which is then keeping me from just sitting down and just figure it out. Um, because I've been doing this for so long in terms of working on the, the development of scripts. Um, I turn myself off sometimes. It's like, ah, it's not, that's, that's not a good enough idea. That's not really fair. I shouldn't do that. Um, we should be a little bit more lenient, you know, with ourselves. Just test an idea out, see what comes of it. And really in a way I'm telling myself this, <laughs> just throw some stuff on the wall, see if it sticks. Yeah, if it doesn't, fine. You know, you move on to the next one, but we need to spend time in those upper levels technically speaking, like I just said, the lower levels of, of development before you get to the page writing. Otherwise, it's just, you know, kind of, I don't want to say wasting your time, but you're jumping, you're jumping the gun, gun. you're putting the cart before the horse. Um, that is it, everybody. That's my lecture. Patrice, if we have questions, I'm happy to dive in. It was a lot. 
Um, and I, you know, hopefully you, your brains aren't exploding. Um, question, should new writers follow this advice? What Write the story first, try to sell it second. Yeah, I think so. Definitely, you know, from, from a general approach of what do I do with this idea? Of course, you're thinking who could buy this? Where could it live? Who's the cast? Um, all those things are important. But if you're just at the beginning stages of writing, not like from your level of a career, but the beginning stages of this project, yeah, just fall in love with the story. Why do I love this story so much? What pulls me in? What makes me passionate about it? Um, and just focus on that. Eventually, you will find yourself once you start you know, setting projects up, getting writing assignments, you, you get a manager agent, you're getting offers and things, and then you might you actually sell a project and it's your project and you stay on it. Um, then you might, you know, your career is going to change a little bit. You might come to this place of, well, I do need to come up with something that it sells. <laughs> That's what my agent's expecting. That's what the studio is expecting. That's what they're hiring me to do. So it depends on where you are in your career. Um, if you haven't, um, you know, fully sold something yet, we'll say, and you're still kind of on, you know, unproduced. Yeah. Just write the story. Um, submitting to festivals helpful for finding agents. It sure can. It can definitely be helpful. Um, a lot, it, a lot of it depends on the festival and the, I'll, I'll kind of add contests in there. Um, you know, screenplay contests, some of the bigger ones for sure. Um, you have industry professionals looking at who, you know, is winning these contests, um, who's doing well, you know, at these festivals. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm trying to be as optimistic as I can. <laughs> Don't read into that. Um, it's not guaranteed that if you win a major contest or festival that you are actually going to be repped. I would be instead, you know, as a writer, hoping that a manager finds me through contests or festivals because a manager helps shape your career much more than an agent does. An agent's going to come in when there's business on the table. It's going to, that person is going to help sell your project to this other, you know, company or entity. Um, it's going to help, you know, get cast. It's much more business specific. Um, the manager is going to be giving you notes and developing your craft and, and, you know, trying to set up meetings and getting you noticed, you know, um, how does one find an agent get noticed elsewhere, <laughs> find ways to have other people say yes. A lot of times agents, especially with so-called new writers, unproduced writers, they're looking at the script first and not necessarily you. So they may come on to represent the project. Um, and try to get that sold, and they may not represent you and your whole career. I wouldn't worry too much at this stage if you're unproduced about getting an agent. Don't worry about too much about it. Hopefully, it happens someday. Um, but I know a lot of writers who have had projects produced and made, and they don't have representation. So it's very possible to to get projects out there um, to take pitch meetings. You know, by any other means, like the ISA's development slate is a good one. Um, my teammates really work their butts off for the writers that are on the slate. Um, there are many different ways. Uh, how many times should we rewrite our screenplay? Whew. It's a, it's a good question. I get it a lot. There's no magic number. I wish there was, I think I would say at least once <laughs> a minimum of once, probably you're looking at two or three times. Um, probably even more than that, but also what defines a rewrite, you know, it, it, rewrites are kind of like, after your first draft, it's probably like a 78 to 80% rewrite. Again, depending on where you are in terms of how much time you spent on the front end of developing the idea. Um, and then the next rewrite might be like a 40 or 30% rewrite. And then suddenly it's a 10% rewrite and you're just kind of editing and trimming. And then you do a dialogue pass and you're just kind of, so a rewrite is, is relative. Um, there isn't a magic number. You want to get to a point of where you feel like you can't really come up with anything new anymore. There isn't a new approach to this, but also you've given it to a lot of other sources, consultants, friends that you trust that are, aren't going to BS you, um, your contests, et cetera, you've tested the script um, and you start seeing the same notes come along and then you're going to be noticing um, or applying the notes in terms of the patterns that, that you're seeing throughout all the notes. Once you're seeing that people are responding well to it and you just don't really have the energy or passion to keep going with another rewrite, then it's up to you. It's totally up to you. Um, how does ISA connect? So 
Um, that's a big question. So what, what our one of the membership tiers is called Connect. <laughs> that's where my brain went first. But um, so the ISA development slate, it's kind of difficult to get on the slate now because they have so many writers, but um, all the ISA has a lot of different contests. And then we get a lot of referrals from various um, industry professionals. But then we also have writing gigs. The writing gigs allow you to submit your project based on you know a producer kind of giving a call for scripts, so to speak. Um, and then we have a, a team of, of people that are going through these projects, seeing if they match the mandate of, of the industry pros that we have in our kind of stable. Um, and then also the contest winners, the people who are doing really well in contests. Um, people can just apply and receive five pages of personally, I think the best notes in town. Um, and then if the reader thinks very highly of that script, they'll pass it to the team on the development slate and the development slate will consider that script. If they really like the writing, the project and the writer, they'll take that writer on and keep them kind of on their slate of writers that when industry pros come asking for projects, which they do a lot, um, we're also, our production company is agency repped. And so we have an agent that is, you know, finding new mandates and stuff for us. Um, then we go to those writers that are on that development slate as possible, you know, options to then send out. There's no guarantee, you know, in this industry, it doesn't just, even if in when you get repped, let's say you have both a manager and agent, this is, that's the beginning of your career. I hate to, to you know, break it that way. It really is there. You now have more work to do, which is good. And of course that's the work you want to be doing, but it doesn't necessarily establish that much until you really start selling projects, setting up projects, um, taking writing assignments. Most writers who are working and making a living as a writer are getting assignments in terms of rewrites or coming on to do dialogue passes. Um, they're pitched an idea that isn't necessarily theirs. Like a, a producer says, okay, I like your writing. That project isn't for us, but we have this idea that you might be right for. Can you pitch us your take on it? And then they hire you to write that project. Sometimes you don't even get a credit for it. Um, that's just, it's always been that way. But sometimes you do, you know, sometimes you can negotiate your way there, but most writers are working that way and they make a nice living doing that. So you don't want to just be coming from a place of, I need to write this one script and sell this one script. This isn't soap, <laughs> you know, we're not going to a manufacturer and putting it on a shelf, hoping someone buys it. This is a much different business. And so in a lot of ways, the scripts you're writing are samples of your work that can hopefully get you work. Then maybe as your career starts to lift off a little bit, you can go back to those original spec scripts that you wrote and you start passing those around, you know, and maybe people take a look at it because they're like, oh, this actually could be something. This writer has, you know, defined herself in terms of her career and what she's able to do. She's been staffed on a show for a while, you know, so there are a lot of different ways to connect to the industry. The ISA tries to use, you know, what we have as a resource as a hub for it. I try to take the educational approach, everybody, I really do. Um, Every writer wants access. We all want access. But what gets you access is really good writing. And I, I know it sounds like such a, I don't know, kind of a lazy way of saying it or something. But if you, if you work your butt off at developing your craft and write a lot of screenplays, try to have more than two. You really can't rely on just two. Um, there have been producers who have said you need at least 10 screenplays in your arsenal. I don't know about a, at least, I think, you know, I get what they're saying. You want to show that you can write more than one script um, work, just put the work in and, and try not to get too tied up uh, with thinking, I just finished the script and now I want to get it out into the world and sell it. Of course you do. And we, <laughs> I want you to sell it too, but it takes some time. You know, this, this is, a, even if you start taking meetings and people are like, I love this, let's sign this to an option agreement or a shopping agreement. That process could take a year or more just to then try to pitch it to other people. And let's say then somebody else comes on and takes it and they actually pay you, you know, 80 to $100,000. Then suddenly they have to cast it and they have to package it and they have to get all these people. It, this is a big project. So in a, in a really big way, you're creating a company <clears throat> by writing a screenplay. You know, this is, you're, you're creating jobs that need to be hired on. <laughs> so the best advice I can give, I think, good way to end this. I went a little bit longer. Um, oh, no, we're right on time. We're right on time. Um, 
is to be as patient as you possibly can, not just with the industry, you know, and, and the business of it all, but with your own writing development. Um, this really is something that you can do for the rest of your life. Um, it, yeah, this is to just be patient with your writing development and your craft. Don't be too eager to get a script out before it's ready. Don't accept the first version of your idea. Sometimes the first version is an excellent idea. <clears throat> you can work that idea and really make sure, does the concept sell? Because I, I, I promise you, and I, and I hope this doesn't sound like a cop-out, concept usually trumps writing. Usually, not all the time. But if you have a really great idea and the writing is good and not like exceptional or amazing, you're, you're in good shape. <clears throat> because the pro this what you're doing is just setting up the possibility for other people to come in <clears throat> and work with you. And, and um, it's an invitation to collaborate with other people is really what a screenplay is. So get your writing to a place where you feel confident in your ability and your writing talent and you know how to work the words in the page. Then really focus on what, what's my idea? Is this something that really is important? culturally, socially, et cetera? Does it mean something to me? You know, am I passionate about it? But does it also have this kind of nice hook and people can see this as something that's unique, et cetera, et cetera. Uniqueness is big. Um, so anyway, I could go on and on in terms of um, giving, you know, more and more advice. And I went through all of what I talked about in terms of the, in terms of those four levels of development really quickly. <laughs> so hopefully you were able to kind of uh, consume this and understand what I'm saying, but those four levels of development are important. They're really essential concept, character development, page work, work on the concept, character and, and the structure. Did I say that properly concept, character, structure, page work, work on those three other levels for much longer than you think you should before you get to those pages. And I promise your pages are going to be that much stronger. That's it for me. Um, Patrice, are you going to come back on or um, am I just signing off? <laughs> Hopefully everybody got as much out of this as, as possible. But um, yeah, Patrice, let me know if, if I'm just signing out here. Out. Okay. All right, everyone. Enjoy the festival. A huge thanks to Imagine This. Um, apparently there are a lot of excellent films please watch as many of them as you can. There's a lot you can learn from watching what other artists are doing. So, so pay attention. Um, all right. Hopefully I was helpful.